Paul, you've been focusing in the last few years on um, extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, this is a subject that obviously fascinates everyone, but from a, uh, the point of view of science and from the point of view of humanity, why is this an important endeavor? Everyone likes the idea of searching for sentient beings out there in the universe, and I think the fascination is because, in a sense, it's searching for ourselves. As Frank Drake, who started this whole enterprise over 50 years ago, uh, says, uh, it's uh, a search for ourselves and our place in the universe. So we'd like to position ourselves, are we special, unique, pinnacle of creation or something, okay. or uh, just one of, of many uh, observers or sentient beings or communities uh, scattered throughout space and time. And people have different sentiments about that. My own feeling is I'd love to live in a universe that is uh, teeming with intelligent aliens, but ultimately it's a scientific question. We just don't know, so we have to search, but it's a, a very difficult search. Sure. What are the elements of the search? Well, mostly it's been carried out by using radio telescopes to sweep the skies, hoping to stumble across a radio message deliberately beamed at us by some extraterrestrial community. Now that is a long shot uh, by any means. And the reason is that, uh, first of all, there has to be a community out there that is interested in uh, doing this. Uh, but secondly, uh, even the most optimistic estimates will place that community at being dozens or even hundreds of light years away. So let's take a round figure, a thousand light years Which away. Which is very close, actually. That's right. So up there, a thousand light years away, there may be some community with super duper instruments, and they've been looking at Earth in enough detail to figure not only that there is life on Earth, but there's intelligent life. Now, if they're a thousand light years away, they see Earth as it was a thousand mm -hmm. years ago. There were no radio telescopes. They might see the Great Wall of China or the pyramids and think, well, pre pretty smart people. One millennium soon, they may have radio technology. Okay. Well, surely they will wait until they know we're on the air before sending us their message. Mm -hmm. And so we wouldn't expect to be receiving deliberately beam messages. So I'd like to shift the focus of SETI away from... Search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Search for extraterrestrial intelligence, away from deliberately directed messages, mm -hmm. whether it's radio or laser or some other uh, mode of communication, uh, and look instead simply for uh, signatures of intelligence or signatures of artificiality. What we're looking for is really alien technology. Mm. Wherever it is, on Earth, in our region of the solar system, much more likely out in the depths of space. Uh, the problem is, uh, we have to guess, what is alien technology going to be like? Imagine a civilization that had been around for, say, 10 million years. What would it be doing? What would they build? How mm. would they, what would their footprint be? Mm. Uh, probably wouldn't just be Radio it might be a lot of other things. So we need to be as open-minded as possible and search every data set mm. in as astronomy, biology, earth science. We, we have no idea how or where alien technology might manifest itself. Mm. But against all this, we must always remember that there may be none. So we're searching for something we don't even know if it's there. What are the implications of the possibilities? Possibility of there being life very rare in the universe, but, but microbial life, possibility of, of uh, microbial life being ubiquitous in the universe, intelligent life being uh, uh, rare, or intelligent life being uh, all over the place, or, or us totally alone. I mean, wh what are the philosophical implications of the, of the categories of possible answers? When Frank Drake started this whole game, he wrote down something called the Drake Equation, and now this is a set of terms, uh, all of which go into estimating the number of communicating civilizations. And so, first of all, you need a star, and then you need a planet, and then you need to have life on the planet, and then it needs to evolve intelligence, and then you need a technological community. And there are error bars on all of those. Uh, now, one or two of these numbers have improved a lot since Frank Drake began. Uh, for example, we are pretty sure there are billions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone. Uh, but just because the real estate is out there doesn't mean there's life out there. A lot of people conflate habitability with inhabited. Just because a planet is Earth-like doesn't mean that life will obligingly pop up. It will do so if the transition from non-life to life is a very probable process. But we don't know what that process was. We have no idea 
of the sequence of chemical reactions and physical conditions that led to life on Earth. It could have been stupendously rare, uh, or it might have been very straightforward. Mm. We don't know, and if we don't know, we can't estimate the odds. So we're, we stop right at that point. We don't know the other terms either. We don't know if, when life gets going, what are the chances intelligence will evolve. But we're in better shape there because we actually have a theory. We know the mechanism whereby life goes from cells to intelligence. That's called Darwinian evolution. But we don't know that first step, what turned non-life into life. So we don't know the odds, so we're completely in the dark. What are the implications of some of the possible answers? Maybe we'll not know in our lifetime and maybe it'll be a thousand years before we have an answer. But if humanity survives, uh, technologies will increase. Uh, in their power, and so at some point we will have a better understanding. If we go with increasing technologies for 10,000 years and still find nothing, I think that would be an indication that there probably is nothing. On the other hand, we may find something tomorrow. So what, what, what are the implications for humanity based on the spectrum of possible answers? It's very hard to prove an absence. There may be sure. intelligent life out there just not manifesting itself. We just wouldn't know. Uh, but supposing we come to the conclusion, probably we are alone in the universe. Well, some people take comfort from that. They say, well, we better look after our planet mm. uh, because if we're uh, the only show in town, then uh, we have an obligation to, uh, to keep it going. Uh, that's one point of view. I personally would be uh, disappointed. Uh, I like to think that life and mind are not freak phenomena, not aberrations, but are built into the nature of the universe in a fundamental way. Uh, we have no evidence that they are, but if we should find that the universe is teeming with life, uh, then I think that would give much greater significance to human life. We wouldn't, of course, be the pinnacle of creation, as people used to think, uh, but it uh, would at least mean that we could see ourselves as representatives of an intrinsically bio-friendly universe unfolding in, uh, to its destiny, whatever that might be. This to me is a really critical point because it takes issues whether there's a great deal of life or no life and embeds it with, a, with, a, with different kinds of, uh, of um, conclusions that we would come to. Some people would say if, if we're the only civilization that makes humanity supreme and uh, may give uh, uh, comfort to their religious convictions. Uh, other people would say, if, if humanity is, is the only uh, uh, intelligence in the universe, that that shows a, a universe that is highly uh, biologically unfriendly, and therefore there is no God or anything like that. It's just a, a, a total random accident. On the other hand, if it's teeming with life, maybe it's, it's in, intrinsic in the universe, which is what you just said, which would give you a different understanding of the universe. It's a, it's a fascinating test of your own perceptions on how you imagine uh, what do you imagine the implications are of either life or no life? Well, I think it's straightforward enough because uh, some religious people want the origin of life to be a miracle. I'm a scientist, I don't like miracles. So uh, for me, uh, it's a, a question of a, a chance event, an aberration, a bizarre fluke on the one hand, or something built into the nature of, of the universe that unfolds in an inevitable way on the other hand. And the latter seems to me to give a universe in which I can take much greater comfort as having significance because I've emerged as part of a fundamental process and not a freakish uh, sort of thing that happened along the way of no uh, cosmic significance at all. That's enormously significant uh, in terms of the universe itself because many physicists, of course, would just have the universe uh, be totally random and uh, um, w without meaning or, or purpose. But if life is ubiquitous, you're saying, that could indicate perhaps a different way of thinking? I, I think it very definitely does indicate a different way of thinking because uh, what I see when I look at the universe is uh, a system that is, has a directionality, that it's unfolding greater uh, richness and com complexity and life and mind are part of that unfolding of complexity and that gives greater significance to our existence than if it's just a random mess.